Hello and welcome. This is Garden Fork Radio. I want to thank you for taking a minute to download the show. Um, welcome to our new listeners as well as our regular uh, ongoing listeners. This is episode 450 something. So that means it's about 350 episodes of Garden Fork Radio out there. Most of it with my good friend here, Rick. Hey, Rick. Hey, good morning. How are you, Eric? I'm great. I went and voted today. So that was good. I voted too. Yeah. Yay. I uh, walked walked over to my polling place so I'd get a little bit more exercise and and uh, did the voting and came back. So and pretty good turnout in my precinct. I don't know how yours looked. Um, it was good. I got to. I like it because I get to wear the little. Uh, they give you a little sticker says I voted. <laughs> So right. I'm like, look, I participated in our democracy. <laughs> well, everybody should. Yeah, everybody should. We got a bunch uh, of cool stuff to talk about. Um, yeah. yeah. Organizing a small workshop. Uh, I just bought a used quad. I wanted to talk about that. Rick has done some smoking of pork, fermenting some vegetables, uh, cleaning up your yard. And I wanted to talk about uh, my new, I'm a new fanboy to Curtis Stone, the Urban Farber on YouTube. So I saw that video. That's amazing. Well, let's start with him. I, um, there are some people that it seems like whatever they touch turns to gold. And usually the backstory on that is they've been working on it for 10 or 15 years, you know, and, and they're an overnight success, right? Well, like garden fork <laughs> has yet to be that overnight success, but I've been working on this, I think for nine years now. Um, so but his name is Curtis Stone. If you type in uh, urbanfarmer.co is his website. If you just type in Curtis Stone Urban Farmer on YouTube, he has hundreds of videos. They are geared toward other people that are either doing uh, small farming or CSA farming uh, for a living. But I found that there's so much there I learned just from my own vegetable gardening in my yard Plus the fact that he is gardening in what looks like a subdivision, you know? It is a subdivision. In fact, it's a subdivision in Canada, and he's which makes got it his, even more impressive. He's got his front yard planted. He's got his backyard with open, uh, fee, open, uh, a open garden plot and two big hoop houses. And he's also gardening, raising vegetables in his neighbor's yard. And he has run up against some pushback from that, but he has used what I call social capital and just being nice to your neighbors. Um, and most of his neighbors are cool with what he's doing. And he makes a decent living. He teaches classes. He has a downloadable 12 hour class, or you can go to an in-person intensive class with him. He has a book out and I'm hoping if I can maybe get him on the show, but I learned a ton about how to grow carrots by watching a couple of his videos. Oh, well, I could use that. I'm, I, carrots are my weak spot. Well, Mine carrots and, and squash. Uh, I, can't, I can't get a squash to grow for nothing. The uh, squash bugs take me over before I can even um, get started. Yeah, they they just crawl all over my... I find They get wedged into the screen windows of my house. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I don't want to touch them because they stink, you know? Yeah, I, I, I sure don't want them coming after me. That's... So it's kind of inspiring how, um, and I think we have too much lawn in the world. Um, so if you want to consider taking up some of your yard and planting a garden, um, or if you want to go into um, being a market gardener, and he he does not have a CSA. He sells at farmer's markets and directly to restaurants, and he makes more money. A CSA, from what I've heard him say on his videos, he, he would not make nearly as much money as the way he's going about it. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, check out Curtis. The videos, I it's just like when I'm making dinner, I, I fire one up on the iPad. And while I'm cooking dinner, I watch his videos. And it's just and it's just him talking to the camera, walking through his. Yeah. And it's, it's he, he, like, he, he's got the gift. Yeah. That's it. He's got the gift. Anyway, it's the urban farmer dot co. And um uh, you can find him on YouTube, and I'm sure he has a uh, a website as well. Yeah. But it's it's really fascinating, and, and lots of work with uh, cat. Whoop, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. I just heard the Skype uh, <laughs> thing thing pop. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you uh, are interested in tunnel farming or caterpillar tunnels, that kind of thing, 
Uh, he's got lots of greenhouses. Um, he, he's done remarkable. It's just him and an, another guy, two people working full time, eight months of the year and part time for the rest of the year. And uh, they're they're making a go of it. And I think that's great. Yay. All right. So um, recently, actually, uh, Eric from the Root Simple podcast will be on a future episode talking about how to use your library more effectively. But he just put on a post on his website about reorganizing his small workshop. And that's really useful. Of course, the, the takeaway is uh, wheels, lots of wheels and wheels on everything. So, um, and I, I, you kind of know that, but it's hard sometimes to, uh, you know, get your big pieces up onto the wheels and, and, uh, get them bolted on securely and finding them. Uh, I found the best, um, outlet for almost any kind of wheel that fits on furniture or equipment is, um, down at Harbor Freight or Northern Tool. I was just going to say, go to Harbor Freight. Um, yeah. my, uh, better half thinks that I'm. I think she thinks I'm crazy for this, but everything, almost everything in the basement, and it's a finished basement, um, and I want to keep it nice down there um, in the Brooklyn house, is up on wheels. I have uh, those plastic, you know, plastic shelving that you snap together and you can put your bins in it and milk crates or whatever, blankets and stuff. All of those, I have a video about it. I have two videos about it, actually, of how I built these simple uh, little frames that have wheels and all the shelving sits on that. And I had a flood in my basement. Um, the sewer main clogged and it was raining. And so I had a flood in my basement, but almost nothing was damaged because everything was up about four inches off the floor because of the wheels. Excellent. Uh, that's a good thought. You know, um, I was looking at your website, just, uh, waiting for you to come up on Skype here. And I saw your article about uh, putting rollerblade wheels on your uh, Arion chair, your desk chair. I'm on it right now. Here, I'll move around. Can you hear me sliding around? No, <laughs> can can't you, hear a thing. Can you hear me sliding away from the microphone because I don't yes, have a I level can. floor? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I can hear that. I have to, if I let go of the desk, I slide away now. No. Well, for years, <laughs> and this is not to knock the Arion chair company, which is Herman Miller, I believe. Um, yeah. I got this as a gift, this chair. And... Um, but all chairs have these kind of plastic wheels and they kind of scrape and they, they move around. But I've always realized they scrape up the wood floors and then they finally disintegrated. And I went online and they had rollerblade wheels for office chairs and they were like 25 bucks. And they, I put them in in about three seconds. Uh, I wrote a blog post about it and um, it's so much smoother and quieter. So uh, yeah, ah. good wheels make a difference. I love that. So Aaron from the Impatient Gardener is uh, also redesigning her website, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, she um, she has a lot of energy, and she puts a lot of energy into it. And some of her gardening projects are just phenomenal. I'm. Do uh, you talk to Aaron last week, the week before? Yep, she's on, she's yeah. on the show. I heard. I did not know a thing about those jumping worms or whatever they're called. I'm hoping to have uh, to find an expert on those. I mean, Aaron is knows a lot about it. And I have some worms in my backyard that are, they're incredibly wiggly when you have to pick them up more, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, no, night crawlers kind of fling around, but these things were like insane in my hands. And I'm wondering if it's the same kind of jumping worm. So we'll have mm. to find out about that. Did you have the kind of coffee ground soil? Um, yes. Where you find these? Yeah. See that, that sounds like them, doesn't it? Yeah, so I'm a little concerned. The big my the big takeaway for me is to no longer participate in plant swaps. Um, you know, because people pot up their soil and who knows where that soil came from. And I think as a as a country, we had to be more mindful about where plants are coming from and where they're going cuz the worms, uh, their eggs are just transferred in pots, you know? Right. Yeah. And um, you know, oh, I got back from the vet with one of the dogs yesterday. It was just kind of a routine checkup, and uh, we got to talking about the dog diseases that are going around uh, dog parks, and also these restaurants that will you sit outside and they'll bring you a bowl of water for your uh, for your dog and that yep. kind of thing. Turns out it's a a, a vector for a, a, a papilloma virus, and so it's like herpes, and the dogs get warts inside their mouth. 
if uh. the bowls aren't cleaned. And then the um, the new um, there's uh, some canine influenza that's just sweeping the country, and so we uh, dog parks are definitely off of our um, you know places to go until things clean up a bit. Interesting. My uh, my two Labradors, despite them being goofballs on the camera, um, can be less than friendly to other dogs sometimes. So I have to kind of keep them away from the other dogs in the park. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was out there at 630 this morning. So it was, it was cold. It was 44 degrees and the wind blowing off the harbor. Ooh, ooh. You know, I'm getting my, uh, it's about 60 here and it's cold or cool and overcast. But I got my Swiss chart in yesterday. I'm a little late getting it in. And uh, I'm going to re-plastic my mini hoop house. Oh, and, I'm doing uh, put, that too. Yeah, and put it out in the uh, front yard. You, you were talking about converting front yards to a garden. I have a, at least a demonstration plot on the, the side of the driveway. I've seen uh, pictures maybe, of that, yeah. Yeah, maybe 10, 15 foot long and 8 foot wide. And uh, I do that for my neighbors so they can, you know, see that you can actually grow stuff around here and, and people come over and talk about it and steal my tomatoes, but nah, it's okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> but they're always fascinated by the, uh, the mini hoop house and you've got videos on your, um, on the garden fork site about how to construct them, but you can extend uh, Swiss chard is amazing in this part of the country. Uh, it will survive the, uh, the summer heat most years. It didn't this year and, um, it survives the winter and we can have greens, um, you know, all winter long, and they're easy to grow. They have, at least here, have no um, uh, bug or insect problems. And I, uh, you can take the vein out, and you can um, wilt them down like spinach mm -hmm. in a pan with a little olive oil and garlic. Or if you top them real coarse, and um, you can get some pot liquor out of them, and they taste an awful lot like um, collard greens. Yes. So, and so I'm, I'm thrilled about that. Uh, I keep, uh, I had to plant them, intersperse them with among my tomato plants because my tomatoes are still producing. Those uh, garden gem from the, we talked about it many times, from the Clee Lab at the you know, State, the uh, uh, University of Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some uh, uh, tomatoes that they'll, they'll make the seeds for, for a small donation. And they have just gone like gangbusters this year. So I'm thrilled. It's, it's I, I've, I, after watching some of Curtis's videos and then thinking about my own yard, I'm kind of inspired again to go out there and um, just kind of go, ooh, what can I get growing here in November? <laughs> yeah. You know, what amazed me about Curtis's video was uh, watching them use that uh, uh, greens harvester, the automated green har greens yeah. harvester, yeah. and just scooping up huge amounts of, uh, you know, what would be... Uh, torturous stoop labor uh, you can get uh, terrific harvest in almost no time at all using that device if i forget what he called it yeah um there are a couple of neat gizmos and he goes on to say that sometimes it's better just to buy it rather than try and build it because you know what's your time worth and he has figured that his time is worth 50 dollars an hour so oh. if he can hire someone for 30 an hour to build something uh it's worth it. Sometimes he says, if I can, he also said, if I can hire a carpenter at a hundred dollars an hour and he can build it in an hour and it would take me four hours, well then it's still cheaper to hire the carpenter at a hundred dollars an hour. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, and for me, it's, uh, I build it and then I have to hire a carpenter to correct it. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not very, very efficient. A uh, segue here to um, supporting Garden Fork, but um, Rick mentioned our Patreon campaign in the last show, and then we had some new patrons. So I just wanted to start thanking uh, our Patreon patrons, if that's a mouthful, starting with um, actually the longest running uh, supporters. All right, I'm just going to read off a couple of names here. Uh, Kyle F, or is it Kyle B? I don't want to use last names. Uh, then, then there's uh, Chris S, and then there is uh, Kenny B, and then there's Mary B, and then there's some guy uh, R Kennerly. Mm, I don't know him. From uh, the 
seventh month of 2015. What's that? July. That's July yeah. of 2015. That's when you launched your uh, Patreon, I think. So you've been, uh, oh, you've been, oh, you've given me a lot of money just to be on the show. <laughs> no, I give you a lot of money because I support the work you're doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, this whole idea of uh, being more self-sufficient, DIY, uh, growing your own instead of, um, you know, constantly having to run to the uh, store. I do it as a matter of skill building uh, when I, I grow my own and I'm fermenting now and uh, I'm doing yogurt and all kinds of things, uh, just in case there's a some sort of bobble in the system and I have to support myself for a while, I want to know I have the skills and the techniques and the knowledge to, um, to rebuild that stuff. And by the way, uh, the newest patron, David MC, I'll just call you, um, I totally blanked on sending you a thank you note, so uh, that is coming in the postal mail. All right, sir, so thank you, David. All right, so um, let's move on. You are fermenting vegetables? I am, and it's the most amazing uh, process. Um, my first try was salsa and, uh, she who must be obeyed and I, uh, ate that batch in a, uh, uh, one sitting. It was just, it was terrific. Uh, fermenting as opposed to, you know, you're actually using cultures and it's supposed to be, you know, better gut bacteria, uh, microbiome stuff. And I hope that's true. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. well, you're still standing. So, yeah, but it's, uh, it's not hard. In fact, uh, the hard part is walking past a, uh, a jar full of, uh, vegetables sitting on your counter for five days and thinking, you know, I really need to put that up and, and, you know, put it in the uh, fridge, you put it in the fridge, you know, how can it last? But if, um, the, uh, I used a, uh, jar and a lid and a, an airlock that I got from, um, uh, cultures for health and the airlock keeps the oxygen out and uh, the vegetables will ferment and they I had peppers I had three different kinds of peppers and onion white red onion and white onion and it, they all came out beautiful we tried them last night I'll put a picture on the garden fork uh, question and answer uh, page but they they came out beautiful um, the whole secret of fermentation is give it a sniff if it smells bad, don't eat it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, instead of using vinegar, which is the fast way to pickle something, uh, you can ferment. It takes a few more days, but you get some uh, some real health benefits from it probably. And, and you can, uh, No, go ahead. Uh, no, I said it's just a, an amazing, kind of a nice skill to have. You know, talk about skill building. It's uh, nice to be able to try these things. And your v vegetables will last through the winter. I was in... Um, at what, what then was the country of Yugoslavia, um, a friend of mine was there in a Fulbright scholarship, and it was it still is an amazing country. Um, some recent wars have ruined parts of it. But um, if you want to go to Europe, you want to go to the Balkans, check that out. But they, in the winter, they had um, flowers that they had grown in greenhouses. And we were like, why don't you grow vegetables in the greenhouses? They're like, well, we'd rather have flowers, and then we can always eat cabbage. So they, they just, they ferment cabbage. They have a lot of sauerkraut and then they have beautiful flowers. So. Well, you know, sour, sauerkraut is on my uh, list of things to do or probably kimchi instead of sauerkraut. It's a little more spicy. Yeah. Well, I, I actually think that sauerkraut is the gateway vegetable to fermenting. And I actually have some fermented sauerkraut. Well, I have some oh, fermented really? cabbage in my fridge right now. Um, and I did a update video about fermentation recently. And also, um, Sandor Katz was a guest on Garden Fork Radio a while back. I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes for this show here. So, oh, that's right. She was the, she's the big... Um, he. Uh, he? <laughs> it's a guy, Sandor. Sandor Katz is his name. Sandor. I thought, I thought it was Sandra. Sorry, sir. No, I, I, remember, I remember when you had him on. Yeah. Uh, he's written a book about uh, fermenting. Yeah, a couple, yeah. Yeah. So the other project you're doing in the kitchen is you're, you're smoking pork. Well, we have a guest coming. Uh, she who must be obeyed has gone up to Richmond to uh, drive them back. And so we won't have to cook for a few days. I'm smoking uh, pork loin. 
um, and that'll uh, be our our mainstay for for the uh, evening meals. And uh, it's it's another one of those things. It's just easy to do out back. Uh, every hour I go out and throw a few um, briquettes onto the uh, the fire and um, a piece of apple wood, which I think goes really well with pork. And uh, just let it, uh, you know, never get above about 200, 250 degrees. Be a half-day project, but it will smoke through beautifully. Is this, this is on a Weber grill? It's on the Weber grill. And is the fire underneath the meat or on the side? Or? Oh, no, no. I put the fire way over on the side, and I only use maybe 10 briquettes. And then put the meat as far away on the other side as I can and put the vent on the Weber grill over the meat. So it has to draw over the fire and then pass the meat before on its way out. All right. Yeah. Cause on a Weber grill, the top vent is kind of offset on the dome. And exactly. so you sent, you put that little, it looks like a silver disc that you slide to open up the holes and close the holes. Right. And that's how you control the temperature and um, and how fast it's burning. How do you know when the pork is done then? You know, I use the finger test. Um, you know, if you touch your lips uh, with your fingers, that's yeah. that's rare. If you touch your cheek, that's medium. If you touch the tip of your nose, that's well done. Oh, wow. I'm doing that right now. <laughs> so I, I just, I've always been somebody to finger my meat I mean, I <laughs> okay <laughs> let's just kiss past that <laughs> yeah just go on past by the way i saw your uh, new um troy belt flex um device the log splitter i can't remember if we talked about it again but i watched the video and i'm finding that device more and more um interesting you know appealing if they ever come up with a generator head for it i think i'd buy one immediately well, I can't say for sure, but I've heard talk of that. Um, so full disclosure, everyone, Troy Built is um, Garden Fork's main sponsor, and they have given me uh, a number of pieces of equipment to review. And one of them is called the uh, Flex. It's a, for you old school people, if you know what a Gravely is, which is, um, it was also called the Man Killer. Um, basically, <laughs> it's an engine on powered wheels with it looks like a big walk behind mower that's missing the mower deck instead it has two power takeoffs out the front and you connect various devices to the front of this um i have a pressure washer i have a really wide mower deck i think it's a 32 inch wide mower deck for it and i now also have a, a log splitter that snaps on the front and what I liked about it, and I, I have a video about it, and I'll link to it in the show notes, is most of your decent log splitters are big, and you have to put them somewhere. Uh, this thing folds up on itself. The, the uh, hydraulic cylinder slides back onto the log slab, the, basically the log plate right where the splitter head is. And you can, it's literally in the corner of my garage right now. It weighs a ton. It's like 200 pounds. So Ooh, yeah. you, have, you have to use a hand truck to move it or the flex unit itself. But I'm actually going to use it this weekend um, to split up some more wood. But yeah, it's it's a good rig if you, you want to consider checking that out. Yeah, I just like the idea of having one engine to maintain um, instead of a whole bunch of little engines. Well, I got two different stories about that. Um, oh. for, first of all, um, my quad is a 20-year-old Suzuki King quad. And... Um, the carburetor uh, floods often. The float uh, bowl, I think, has a leak, a hole in it, so it doesn't. So the bowl overfills and gas spills out of the carburetor, and the automatic clutch has been failing. So um, I saved up some money, and um, actually from our Amazon affiliate links. Thank for thank you everybody. And I was starting to look to buy a slightly newer quad, and I, f I bought one uh, last weekend off of Craigslist. And it was, uh, it was actually a very pleasant experience. Craigslist can kind of get, um, you can go down a bad rabbit hole with it. But I had a couple of tips for uh, shopping on Craigslist and negotiating to buy used equipment. Would you like to hear them, Rick? I'd love to hear them. Oh, well, on your emails, always be really polite 
because you don't know the person's name usually. Uh, you just hit reply and it anonymizes the seller's email address. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you're basically emailing through Patreon. And I'm just like, hi there. Um, I'm very interested in your quad you have for sale. A friend of mine has a very similar model. It's a Polaris. Um, it was a 2008 400cc Polaris. I think it's 450cc. But um, And a buddy of mine has one of these, and it's really good. Um, and it was Wednesday, and I didn't have time to see it until Saturday. I said, I would like to come on Saturday. And the person said, okay, I'll see you Saturday. And then I emailed another time, and I didn't hear back. And I'm like, oh, they sold it, you know. Um, and then I emailed on Friday night. I said, just want to make sure I can come look at it. And they said, yeah, you can come look at it. And I'm, I'm thinking it's, you know, some guy and it's in the, in the middle of Connecticut. So, um, I dressed up in Eric garden fork gear and I put on one of my orange hunting hats, you know, cause I'm like, instead of the, cause I have New York plates and I'm showing up with a trailer, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I parked the car actually on the street and I walked up the guy's, the guy's driveway and it's actually more suburban than I realized. And it's not a guy. It's a woman selling it. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, you're a hunter. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I said, I'm a really bad hunter. And I really am a bad hunter um, because I haven't um, hunted and I haven't successfully hunted anything in a really long time. But, um, you know, we got past that and um, she was selling it because her son had gone off to school and I just was... Uh, I just found, tried to find some points of commonality to talk about, you know, uh, oh, her son went to school and, you know, we talked about, oh, I have a friend that's going to that school. I have a friend that teaches at that school. And I thought the price was a little high for what uh, these were selling for. You can look at Craigslist at a national level, actually, and see what items what like a car what's you know what's a 2005 dodge minivan selling for around you know mm -hmm. and instead of you know being kind of blunt or rude i was just kind of i don't look at the person i'm kind of looking at the the quad and i said so is there some uh negotiating room on the price um and I always just kind of wait. I don't. And after that, I say nothing. I just there's an awkward silence usually. And um, she said, well, there's a little bit, you know, what were you thinking? And I said, well, how about this? And she said, OK, that's close enough to my number. You know, that's fine. You know, and I bought it. So but I wasn't um, obnoxious. I was just as, as nice as I could be. And I think that that is kind of a boomerang thing where uh, I think you'll get farther in life and you'll do better at negotiating. So, yeah, you know, uh, one of the things that's popped up around here, I'm sure they're probably it's all over the country now, is um, police departments have spots outside the police department that are video monitored that they advertise as a place where you can go and make these transactions. Yeah. Now, the police police are not going to be there, but it's going to be videoed all the way around. And, uh, you know, if there's if you if it's high dollar item or if you're afraid that somebody may be trying to take it away from you and not pay you and that kind of thing at least it's all on video and it's right there in front of the police department which i think is a pretty good idea yeah because um there actually are unfortunately scams on craigslist as they are in other social media um and there was actually um, another quad for sale that's this insanely low price but it was written really oddly and the photo had the guy's email address um, um, put dropped on in Photoshop or something as well, and uh, I was just like, "There's something wrong with that." And it mm -hmm. had been it had been deleted later in the day. So, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And it's the kind of thing if everyone anyone ever asks you to wire them the money uh, uh, or send it by Western Union or something, uh, that is a giant red flag. Yeah, politely decline. Yeah. <laughs> So I just, you know, taking the high road, you can, um, you can negotiate. And I, I, I felt better not paying the full price. I was like, okay, I think I got my money's worth here and, uh, I'm going to go up into the woods with my trailer and my quad and my neighbor did some logging. So there's a bunch of felled, uh, slash there that is perfect for firewood. And then I'm going to split it with my splitter. And, uh, I love doing that. Wow. 
Well, lucky you. And are, are you going to do maple syrup this year? Oh yeah, I uh, actually have. I'm going to modify the firebox on my maple syrup evaporator. I'm going to post a, pictures of it on a site called Maple Trader. They have a forum where these really, really nice people talk about making maple syrup and ask them how I can improve the firebox on my evaporator. Oh, that's sweet. Wow, that's really great. If anyone knows anything about it, uh, radio at gardenfork.tv. Um, basically, the firebox right now is 42 inches long, which is too big, and the heat just goes up the stack, and I burn wood. The wood burns really quickly. And the goal here is to create some turbulence in the firebox so the heat sticks around more before it blows out the chimney. So, so you, um, you need some baffles in there of some sort. Exactly. And there's a couple different ways to do that uh, with a uh, evaporator firebox. So I'm learning all about that. And there'll okay. be a video, of course. Of course. Uh, all right. Well, I bet you people have gotten to where they're going to be. Yeah. We try to try to keep these to about 30, 35 minutes. Yeah. And we still had we only hit half our list, but that was great. No, oh, we have a list for uh, the rest of the week. You know, we'll probably be able to do these a lot more frequently now that, uh, you know, it's cooling off and we're settling down and, and uh, you know, looking for projects to work on. Yeah. What are you doing, Rick? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> are you doing anything? Yeah. <laughs> we got to talk about something. But um, let me see. I will put a, a picture of my latest fermentation project on the Internet, uh, up on the Facebook uh, site. And uh, I need to get outside and start my uh, smoker, and the dogs are in desperate need of a walk. All right. Well, good on you then. So, everyone, thanks for listening. Uh, everything we talked about will be in the notes, which are available on the iTunes uh, episode as well as at our website. So, make it a great day. Okay. Talk to you later, my friend. Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Thank you.